welcome back again appreciate you stopping by on today's video everyone so we are talking about tank destroyers again yes uh, it's something that for some reason whenever I talk about on my channel with tank destroyers everybody gets highly upset uh, there's no such thing as tank destroyers post 1945 blah 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 yes I understand uh, everybody's definition of tank destroyers is very different uh, but this is designated as a tank destroyer the vehicle we're talking about today which is the IT-1 uh, which is basically Russian for Istrobitel Tankov, or Tank Destroyer. It's actually designated as a Tank Destroyer. Uh, specifically an anti-tank guided missile Tank Destroyer uh, placed upon a tank chassis, which is kind of interesting. You don't see that very often uh, in either history or in modern day times. And of course, the Tank Destroyer is somewhat of a old technology nowadays, really. Uh, but it's perhaps best known as the series of Soviet tanks armed with the anti-tank missiles instead of a conventional gun, and is essentially a T-62 with a Draken ATGM launching system installed inside of it. Uh, its designation is a bit of a throwback, though, to the IT series of the light tank destroyers designed mostly before and during the Second World War, but there was nothing obsolete about this vehicle by the time it was actually conceived. The Second World War is often considered to be the golden age of tanks, but if the 1940s belonged to the gun, it can be said that the 1950s and 60s were definitely marked by a certain fascination, by all countries at that time, by guided missiles. When it came to aircraft, this fascination actually eventually led some fighter jets that ditched a cannon altogether. On the ground, things stayed more conservative. The first actual anti-tank guided missile was likely the German X-7, developed at the end of the Second World War. As its designation suggests, it's an experimental design that was very likely never really fielded, but the documents for it were seized by the Allies and early French SS-10 AGMs from 1960 to 1970, if not an improved copy, was heavily inspired by the X-7. Naturally, this didn't escape the attention of the Soviets, who had troubles of their own. While the T-54 was quite sufficient to defeat any German World War II tank, the post-war American M-48s proved to be resistant to its armor-piercing ammunition, and even sub-caliber ammunition couldn't defeat them at over 1,000 meters. That left the Soviets with 100mm heat ammunition that could do the job fairly well, but it had problems of its own, specifically its lower accuracy at longer distances. In this perspective, the development of ATGMs was seen as an ideal solution to defeat Western tanks and a program was launched to develop the first anti-tank guided missiles. The first real discussion about putting ATGMs in tanks in the Soviet Union took place between 1955 and 1956. There were several outputs from the discussion, or more specifically, instructions regarding the direction of the development. The future ATGM vehicles were supposed to be fully tracked, with protection equal to tanks, with a launcher and its operator protected by the tank's armor, the vehicle was supposed to be able to fire only when stopped, the vehicles with missiles were to be ready to be used by the end of the 1950s. In other words, the Soviets wanted a tank, but with missiles as its main armament, not a gun. The demand for the internal launcher departed significantly from the way that the French were doing it with external launchers and presented a number of different challenges. The development of the first missile systems took place between 1955 and 1959 and there were plenty of ideas to put ATGMs on pretty much everything, from light amphibious tanks to heavy tanks. Multiple different ATGMs were designed as well, however by 1960 only two types of infantry ATGMs were accepted into service. They were the Schmel Falange, NATO designation AT-1 and AT-2, and with the first tank ATGM, a program called Draken, expected in the mid-1960s. The reasons for the delays were, apart from the usual lack of funding, which I always tend to measure on this channel, is the relative inexperience of the Soviets at the time with this kind of system, both on the development and production side. One thing that made it worse for the Soviets was the interference of the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, who loved HGMs and had a very unrealistic expectation, something that would come to haunt the project later on. Unfortunately, to make matters worse, the Soviet heavy tank development program was completely cancelled, in theory supposed to free up some resources, but a portion of the ATGM research went away with it, as these programs were totally connected, at least in Leningrad. Kharkov decided to initially dump the program in favour of a new gun-armed tank that eventually resulted in the T-64. With its own missile-armed tank, the Object 431, never really going anywhere. 
However, Nirti Tagil, who saw an opportunity to use the missile tank program to get enough resources to develop another of the tank components, such as suspensions, would later be used to build the T-72. The Draken program, however, had the goal of creating a medium weight category armoured vehicle launcher, which is around 25 to 30 tonnes with a crew of 3 to 4. Regarding the missile itself, as part of what I just mentioned with the Draken program from 1957, there are a number of debates regarding how it should have actually been controlled. The problem, yes, another one, was that the missile tank requirements changed from a purely defensive measure to an actually offensive one. And that meant the addition of the ability of firing on the move, at least formally, and sitting inside a rolling tank, which, if you haven't experienced it, can be one hell of a bumpy ride. And while trying to guide a missile manually, that really wasn't physically possible. Another option was fully automatic guidance. In theory, the Soviets had plenty of experience. There were operational AAGMs in existence already, but neither heat-seeking nor radar guidance were really working on the ground. As a result, the most practical solution at the time was a semi-automatic guidance, where the gunner was tracking the target constantly and the missile reacted automatically in order to hit the marked target. The development of the missile fell to OKB-16 Design Bureau under the AE Nudelman, responsible for the Falanga system, and the guidance system development fell to KB-1 under AA Kosolov. The cooperation didn't really work out so well though. The KB-1 was an experienced team, having worked on many guided weapons, mostly aircraft missiles. But having other priorities, it did not have the time to focus on the ground ATGM program. OKB-16 was another experienced bureau. You might recognise the name Noodleman from a successful series of aircraft cannons, responsible for the Falanga ATGM as well. But they wanted to reuse Falanga solutions as much as possible, and on top of that, both bureaus didn't really work well with each other at all. Eventually, in 1958, a third design bureau, CKB-14, entered the project, which was subsequently passed to it from OKB-16. This happened in 1959, and by that time, OKB-16 designed the general look of the missile, which is why it never really often listed itself from the designer. From 1959 onwards, the bulk of the Drac and ATGM development was carried out by CKB-14. The result of this development was a semi-automatically guided 3M7 Draken missile. The whole system was called the 2K4 Draken. The maximum range of this missile was 3,300 meters, although at night this was greatly reduced by the requirement for the operator to actually see the marked target. Even with his IR sights, the maximum range at night was around 400 to 600 meters, which was pretty useless at the time. A major issue turned out for its minimum range at 300 meters at night, and this created a very small window of engagement. The missile's caliber was 180 millimeters, and it weighed 54 kilograms, 5.8 kilograms of which was the warhead itself. Its flight speed was around 217 meters a second, and it could penetrate some 250 millimeters of rolled homogeneous steel armor at 60 degrees. Fully automatic heat-seeking guidance was looked into as well, but like before, it turned out to be very unreliable. So I guess let's finally get round to talking about the IT-1 and the platform itself. The first version of this vehicle, referred to as the Object 150 from December 1957, was to be used as a modified version of the Object 140 prototype tank. The Object 140 was designed as a competitor for the Object 430, but it did not pass into production. It's however worth noting that the design documents mentioned other platforms as well, such as the Object 167 and the Object 17T. The idea of the vehicle was to design a lighter version of the tank with only four road wheels, thinner armour, approximately 20% less protection compared to the T-55 tank, and no gun. It was replaced by the Draken launcher that was installed on top of the turret. A lever arm would lower itself towards the turret, receive the missile from an automatic feed mechanism inside, ready itself for firing, and then launch the missile. In other words, apart from the time directly before the launch, the missiles were always stored inside the tank. The missiles would be guided by a stabilised T2S sighting system and at day and lunar P systems at night. The system would carry up to 15 missiles. Fully loaded, the whole thing would weigh some 32 tonnes and would be powered by a standard tank diesel engine. All in all, it was quite well protected as a tank destroyer with excellent frontal armour that could use an MBC system, which was very important at the time with the threat of nuclear war very real in the minds of its strategists, and could be sealed from underwater crossings. 
As a bonus, the vehicle was lower than the T-55, giving it a bit more of an advantage in combat. However, this vehicle had a number of flaws. The missiles were massive and very difficult to place and reload. The missiles had a very complicated stabilization system, reducing their reliability. Many launch elements were located at the top of the turret, making them quite vulnerable to enemy fire. Three out of the 15 missiles carried were located outside of the automatic rack and can only be reloaded when the turret was positioned in a specific way. The loading process was fully mechanized. In a case where the loader was somehow damaged, the missile could not be loaded manually by the crew and basically put the vehicle completely out of action, which is something you don't see in more modern day autoloaders for tanks of the Russian origin. Additionally, each missile was stored in a rather heavy container that significantly increased the weight per missile. In any case, this early draft involved some raw estimates as the KB-1 Design Bureau didn't share the actual data required to complete the project until months later. The first two Object 150 mock-ups based on the T-55 chassis were ready by April 1959 and were transferred to Kobinka in September, but the missile system was still not quite ready yet for testing and planned 1959 tests were officially moved to 1963. Yes, it took almost four years to get all the kinks ironed out. One of the biggest reasons for the delay of this project was the interference from Khrushchev. What happened was roughly this. In July 1960, Khrushchev came to the Karpatsin VR proving grounds to take a look at the various missile vehicles, including the Object 150. When the vehicle prototype was introduced to the Soviet leader, Khrushchev started demanding high-tech features nobody else wanted at the time, such as missile wings opening in mid-flight and replacing the mechanized ammo rack with a drum-like automatic loader. While he wasn't completely unrealistic with his ideas, some of these ideas required huge amounts of time and money to develop and would not appear for years to come. Because of the debate and consideration of these ideas, it cost the Soviets even more time in developing the project. As I mentioned before, until 1961, various platforms were considered for the vehicle, including the Object 167. In 1961, the final platform was finally selected, the T-62 tank, which at the time replaced the T-55 production. Between 1962 and 1963, a series of tests of prototypes of this new iteration took place. The biggest change was the new loading mechanism that was mostly hidden inside the vehicle, and was working with a rate of 2-3 to three rounds per minute. Unlike before, the loading arm launcher was, for the most of the time, hidden inside the vehicle and covered by an armoured plate. It only appeared outside the vehicle when it was readying itself to fire. The vehicle was also compared to the Object 432 medium tank armed with the 150mm Molot smoothbore gun. The Object 432 would become the T-64, and the results were fairly interesting. The Object 150 could kill enemy tanks at longer ranges, 3.5km compared to 3km. At a distance of 2 to 3 kilometers, the Object 150 could kill 2 to 3 more times as tanks as the Object 432. On average, the ammunition carried allowed it to kill 10 more tanks compared to the Object 432's 6 tanks. In 1964, two or more of less of the finalized Object 150 vehicles were tested and fared pretty good, leading to an order of 10 vehicles and 300 missiles to be delivered in 1965 in order to subject them to even more trials. Several more flaws were uncovered and fixed, and finally, on September 3rd, 1968, the vehicle was accepted into service under the designation of the IT-1. Finally, Russia had its missile anti-tank destroyer. The production version of the IT-1 weighed 35 tons and had the same armor as that of the T-62 medium tank. It had the same engine too, and could go as fast as 50 km an hour. It could carry 15 9M7 improved Dracon missiles. The 3M7 was renamed to the 9M7 due to the change in the military nomoculture system. Twelve of these missiles were mechanized in a magazine that could be launched while the vehicle was going as fast as 20 km an hour. The missiles had to be somewhat pre-programmed and pre-installed into the vehicle ready for firing, which took time and calibration. It's worth noting that the vehicle's speed had relatively low impact though on the missile's accuracy. Now believe it or not, the vehicle actually worked very well for its time, but unfortunately, just like most Soviet tanks and programs of its time, it had one major problem. Delays. Like many solid vehicles before it and after it, it became the victim of major delays on the program. It simply came too late, as by 1968, the concept of a dedicated tank destroyer was completely obsolete. 
The IT-1 could not fit into standard tank formations as it could not participate in close combat due to its minimum range of 300 meters, and if used at long distances, its thick armor was actually pointless and the missile carrier role could be performed by more lightly armored BMPs. Furthermore, the Soviets came to the conclusion that rather than a supporting dedicated missile carriers like the IT-1, it was far more efficient to support gun-launched ATDM missiles, retrofitting standard tanks with it. As a result of these considerations, it was decided to produce the IT-1 in very limited numbers only. Between 1966 and 1970, 220 vehicles were built along with these several thousand Draken missiles. These vehicles were split into two dedicated tank destroyer battalions, one located in Belarus and the other one in the Carpathian military district. The vehicle was generally very reliable, but due to its limited production it suffered from a lack of spare parts, an issue that turned quite serious starting from 1970 onwards and eventually resulted in its complete removal from active service between 1972 and 1973. The vehicle was never exported and never fire a shot in anger. After being phased out, some IT-1s were converted to the BTS-4V tractors and others had their armament removed and served as training vehicles. As for the Draken missile itself, its development was an important lesson for the Soviets, a lesson that would be applied in future ATGM developments. So it's safe to say this vehicle was left on the drawing board for far too long, too much improvements were required, uh, lots of umming and ahhing, ooh should we do this, should we do that, uh, people were sticking their nose in where they didn't need to be, uh, teams that were developing it just weren't getting along, uh, and it was just kind of doomed from the start with all these things taken into consideration. If the vehicle was actually capitalized on a little bit more and was focused on a bit more, it could have had a successful future, but as mentioned, the tank destroyer in this formation and this consideration just isn't applicable for the modern battlefield. There's no requirement to have just a tank that launches missiles when you have cheaper, faster, more nimble vehicles that can carry more and quicker accurate missiles than that of a main battle tank. So there you have it folks, a doomed from the start somewhat tank destroyer for the Soviet army back in the day. A really cool concept though, I absolutely love the way that missile is pulled out of the uh, turret like that. Big, fat, chunky, high explosive anti tank missile to take out, you know, what at the time was uh, fairly lightly armored vehicles of NATO doctrine. Uh, but I just was kind of sad to know that it was just never going to be a thing. They kind of just got rid of it. Uh, and it just makes sense. It's just not a vehicle that makes much practical sense back in those days. Uh, it was just too late to the party, I guess. So I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the IT1 today. Make sure that if you did enjoy, you leave me a like so uh, we can get that YouTube algorithm juices flowing. I really appreciate everyone supporting the channel recently, leaving comments and likes and sharing it around on your own social media. It really does mean a lot. If you want to support my channel furthermore, uh, please go check out my Patreon page uh, if you wish to donate or support on there. And thank you to everyone who's been doing so. It really does mean a lot to me. Uh, you can check out also my other social media links below in the link description box. I've got Instagram, Facebook, all the other usual stuff. Um, I do really appreciate you all being here today. And again, if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future, make sure you hit the little bell button by the subscribe button so you can be notified of when it's coming. Okay, folks, stay safe in all these crazy times, and I uh, hope to see you on the next video. All the best. Bye-bye.